Welcome back to another Kicked Up Chemistry with Professor Leonard, Laboratory Edition. Today we're going to be doing a precipitation reaction lab. Now, these are also known as double replacement reactions or cation exchange or anion exchange, and you're going to want to use solubility rules in order to figure out what the products are. So if you have not already, make sure that you download the precipitation reaction lab and you'll notice that I already filled in, besides having the name, I also filled in the formulas of each of the, the nine different compounds that we're going to be mixing together today to see if there is a reaction or not. Now, there are a total of 20 different reactions here. So I've got three test tube racks set up, so that way we can just go down the line with them. So let me move some out of the way here so we just have one at a time and then once I explain the lab I'll go ahead and I'll zoom in on here so you can see whether or not there's a reaction or not. Now all of these occur in aqueous solution which means that they're dissolved in water so when you mix the ions together what will happen is they bump into each other and some of them will clump together and they decide they don't want to be soluble in water and they'll fall out of the solution hence they precipitate just like rain precipitates from the sky along with snow and ice and hail and everything else that falls from the sky. And so anyway, there are 20 reactions total. And as I mix each of them together, I'm going to go in order. So this is going to be number one, number two, number three, number four, so on until we get all 20 of them done. You're going to record whether or not there's a reaction and describe the reaction. What, how do you know it's a chemical reaction? What does the precipitate look like? What's its color? Does it look chunky? Does it look just like a, turned into a milky type solution? All of those are going to be indicators of a chemical reaction. So before we get started, I will make sure that I put on my safety goggles, safety first always, and make sure that you have your sheet ready to go so that way you can record as I go through each of them the different reactions. If there are some, some of them, there's no reaction. And I told the joke in chemistry class, I got no reaction. Today I've got my, of course, my VP Racing Fuel shirt on. Um, I, the other day I had one on, and it said if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the precipitate. Precipitation reactions would have been ideal for today. All right, let me zoom in here on the test tube rack. Okay, what I did is I put some black paper, a construction paper, behind each of the test tube racks because a lot of these are, are going to be a white colored precipitate and I thought it would show up a little bit better. Now, the first seven reactions all involve silver nitrate. And so what I'm going to do is I have the first seven test tubes here. I'm just going to load up with silver nitrate. So a couple of drops each. So. Okay, now that I have silver nitrate in my first seven test tubes here, I'm just going to follow the same order. So in test tube number one, according to our sheet here, we have to add some NaCl, sodium chloride. So I've got sodium chloride. These are all 0.1 molar solutions. And I'm just going to add a couple of drops and see if we get a reaction or not. Those. Oh, and definitely there is a chemical reaction there between silver nitrate and sodium chloride. So on your lab report sheet, under number one, description of reaction, uh, you could just write white precipitate or however you want to describe that one. So in number one, definitely a chemical reaction and you describe what you see there. The best is how you want. In test tube two then, we have to put a little bit of HCl, hydrochloric acid. So we'll see again, silver nitrate, hydrochloric acid reaction too. And again, we get quite a bit of a reaction there between the HCl and the silver nitrate. Number three, sulfuric acid. And we'll take a little bit closer look at that one and does not appear to be any precipitate so reaction three would be no reaction how about 
has two four. We have sodium sulfate. In there. And again, no reaction. Nothing there. You can tell that, for instance, that one, definitely a reaction. Three and four, no reaction. So we're on to number five. Number five, sodium carbonate. So sodium carbonate, commonly known as washing soda, not to be confused with baking soda. And definitely a reaction there. Again, a lot of times there are white precipitates. That's just how nature happens to have it. There will be a couple that have some different colors in there. Uh, this one might. So here we have potassium chromate, K2CRO4. Again, all 0.1 molar solutions, so we are up to number six. Silver nitrate, potassium chromate. And look at that. Hey, we finally got one that's not a white precipitate. And so you can kind of see how it's chunky, and it turned a red color. So we have two indicators. We have a solid form, and we have a color change. And now on to test tube number seven, lead nitrate. So we have some lead nitrate here. Get up a little bit. No reaction. So number seven, no reaction. And then, so if you're following along, you should have one through seven filled out. Number eight, silver nitrate and barium chloride. So let me move this test tube rack out of the way and we'll slide another one in. Now remember that I already put the silver nitrate into that first test tube there so I don't have to worry about putting the silver nitrate back into there again. And this one involves barium chloride. So Silver nitrate's already in there. I had some barium chloride. And indeed, we have a reaction. So we have a white precipitate formed in test tube number eight. We are up to number nine. So I'm going to add a little bit. So now we're going to go ahead and we have to mix these ones together. These aren't all the same um, in the solution like the last one was where we had seven silver or eight silver nitrates in a row so the next two involve potassium chromate so I'm going to put a little potassium chromate in this one a little bit in that one doesn't take a whole lot typically what we do with this lab is we actually use micro well plates so they're small little plastic plates and it only takes one or two drops each I thought this would show up a little bit better on camera using some test tubes instead so that's why I'm using the test tubes. And in test tube nine, I have to add lead to nitrate. So let me find my lead to nitrate right there. And then we'll add a drop or two. Two drops is plenty of some lead to nitrate. Oh, look at that. And we get a nice precipitate there. A yellow, bright yellow precipitate. I don't think it shows up on camera as neat and bright, vividly colored as it does in person. And then in test tube number 10, we need some barium chloride. So I have the barium chloride, and I'll add two drops of that. One, two, that's all it takes. And definitely we can see that indeed this has a yellow precipitate as well. Kind of a light, lighter whitish yellow precipitate as compared to that one. All right, so we're up to number 11. So we have sodium carbonate. So I'll get out my sodium carbonate. And lead to nitrate. So the lead nitrate again. Put a little sodium carbonate. A couple drops of lead to nitrate. Okay, 
and indeed we could see there is definitely a precipitate there. C11 between sodium carbonate and lead 2 nitrate, yes, there is a reaction and we get a white precipitate. Up to number 12, sodium chloride and lead nitrate. So we'll find the sodium chloride. And the lead nitrate. A little extra in that one. Oh, wow, that really made a reaction. Sometimes this one it doesn't make a really great reaction and some people miss it, but today uh, we can definitely see, look at all that white solid in there. So you can see the liquid, clear liquid on the top and everything precipitated out already so quickly. So definitely a reaction in number 12 between sodium chloride and lead 2 nitrate. So on to number 13, sodium sulfate and lead 2 nitrate. So again we have lead nitrate. And the sodium sulfate. And again, we definitely have a reaction in that one. On to number 14, sulfuric acid and lead nitrate. So we'll put our lead nitrate in. We'll add a little bit of sulfuric acid. And definitely we can see in that case we do have a precipitate formed as well. So in number 14 between sulfuric acid and lead nitrate, definitely a reaction. All right, so up to number 15, I got to switch test tube racks here again. And reaction 15 is barium chloride and lead to nitrate. So we'll find the barium chloride. Put a little of that in. The lead to nitrate. A couple of drops of that in. Now this one is really hard to see, and that's part of the reason why I did this one. Uh, in test tubes is there is a very, very slight precipitate in there. In fact, if I add just a little bit more of that barium chloride, let's see if I can get it to precipitate. There's a little bit. Okay. So there is our fine little precipitate. So there's little floating stuff in there. So definitely there is a reaction here. And I'll just put a little bit more just to see if we can get it to react a little bit more. And there you go. There you can see it just took a little bit more. And now we can see that there definitely is a reaction. So when we do this in the microwell plate, that one is often missed because it's such a fine precipitate. And it takes quite a bit more solution in order to do that. The reason for that, I have uh, some theories on but it's beyond the scope of our course and involves the common ion effect and what are called KSPs. So we'll just continue on with our laboratory experiment. So in 15, there is definitely a reaction and it was a white precipitate. And there is our white precipitate. On to number 16, hydrochloric acid and lead nitrate. Put our lead nitrate in. hydrochloric acid. This one again I'm going to use a little bit extra because sometimes this one is a really fine precipitate and if you only use one or two drops sometimes you miss it. So I put a little extra in there and we can definitely see that there is a reaction for number 16 between hydrochloric acid and lead to nitrate. Now on to number 17 barium chloride. There's barium chloride. and sodium carbonate. Definitely a white precipitate in that one, so there is a reaction. So we haven't had a no reaction for a while. Uh, maybe we'll get one more, maybe we won't. We'll have to find out. On to 18, barium chloride. 
and sodium carbonate. Definitely a reaction in that one. On to 19. So number 19 is barium chloride again. With sulfuric acid. Definitely a reaction in that one. Don't even have to zoom in on that one. And number 20, sodium chloride, which again, commonly known as table salt. But again, it is only one of hundreds, if not thousands, of salts that are, by definition, a salt, a product of an acid-base neutralization reaction. So again, I just got salt water in there right now. And then I have to add some sodium carbonate, some washing soda. How about that? Our very last one, no reaction. So number 20, definitely no reaction. All right, so now that you have all 20 of these recorded, I put a couple of questions on here for you. So using your textbook or another source, you could Google it if you want. Define these terms, solute, solvent, and solubility. Number four, on what page of your textbook would you find a table of solubility rules? So tell me what the page number is. So your textbook does have solubility rules in it. you got to write down the page number in which you would find these solubility rules. And then on number five, how might this knowledge of solubility assist someone in developing their own line of organic shampoo? Say, for instance, that you came up with this really great shampoo, and it's all organic, which, again, means all natural and the everyday world in the chemistry world organic is carbon-based compounds and a lot of organic compounds aren't things that you're going to want to put on your hair they would be things like uh, toluene and benzene and uh, tetrahydrofuran and different things like that so you, you have the organic definition in terms of it's healthy for you not the organic chemistry definition of make sure you got your goggles, your gloves, and your lab coat on when you're using it. And how might this idea help you figure out what ingredients you should put in your shampoo? What are some different things? Now keep in mind in the beginning of the report, I explained in here some ideas with water and kind of take off on those ideas and about what different impurities you may have in water and figure out then in complete sentences, just a short little description, how might this help somebody that's going to make their own line of organic shampoo? Well, thanks again for watching Kicked Up Chemistry with Professor Leonard, Laboratory Edition, Precipitation Reactions. I'll see you later.